All right, I guess uh, this begins our, our Facebook broadcast for the afternoon. My name is Dr. Fred Bertino. I'm super happy to be here with all of you who are tuning in. Uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, a little bit of a nebulous topic, um, something about where does the third year medical student study schedule actually fill in when you're not actually part of a classroom at this stage in your game? Um, I'm seeing that a couple people are joining us right now. Super to have, happy to have you all with us. And if there are uh, questions that any of you have, the best part about these live sessions is that if there's any questions that you have, you can feel free to enter them into the comments below. I'll see them in real time and I'll be able to answer them as best as I possibly can for you as we go along. I have a few behind the scenes questions, um, but we can sort of get those going. And if anybody has more to chime in, then I'm happy to answer those also. A little bit about myself. I'm a radiology resident in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I've been working with MST for about three years now, and it has been such an awesome experience. I work with such amazing people. And uh, something that drew me to MST was just the overarching passion that we all have for education, especially of people who were working so hard, tirelessly, tirelessly trying to do so well on these qualifying exams so that you can all be the best doctors that you possibly can be. So I'm really happy to be here to sort of allay any anxieties that I'm capable of and uh, I hope we have a really great discussion um, in the next couple of hours. Uh, I think I'll start um, by going off of some of the questions that we had in the background. Um, someone had asked an interesting question about CK specifically, and it was more of a question about what if I draw a blank on a question? Uh, how long should I stick with a question when I'm drawing a blank versus even moving on to the next question? Um, while this is an entirely valid question and certainly has something to do with anxiety, um, it's definitely more of a test-taking question that I'm sure in future Facebook, Facebook Live sessions will cover uh, in a lot more detail. Um, for now, what I can tell you, the short answer is that remember that each question on whether it's the step one, the step two, even the step three, it's designed to be answered in about 70 to 80 seconds maximum. If you're thinking longer than that amount of time, you're probably thinking too hard about it. And then remember that you've already put the time into studying. You know what you're talking about. You've been doing this for a while. If your gut is trying to tell you something that B is the right answer, you should probably listen to your stomach. It might, at that one moment in time, know more than your brain. Um, I feel like I have so many personal stories of where that actually was true, and it has helped me figure the answer out on numerous occasions. So I can personally attest to that, N equals one, and uh, I'm sure that there are some other students and colleagues that you have out there who would be able to justify that claim. Um, when we're thinking about the third year of medical school, though, it's, like I said before, a very nebulous time. You finished your second year, you're coming out of the classroom, and you're starting yourself in a environment that is entirely clinical, you're in a hospital, you're rotating every six to 12 weeks depending upon how your school has your rotation set up, so you're jumping from subject to subject on a relatively quick um, time course, and realize that you're being taught by people who are actively taking patients at the same time that you are learning from them. And two, these people have tremendous experience in their field, far more than you have at this stage in your education. So it's really easy to feel, one, like an imposter. Number two, like you certainly shouldn't belong there. And number three, overwhelmed about all the information that you're about to take in and how focused you're going to have to be on this exam to ace it. Tack that onto the fundamental of there's no time for me to just sit down and open a book like I did in my first two preclinical years. How am I going to learn this stuff? Hopefully, I can answer some questions that are designed to cover the MS3 anxieties that cover there. Um, so when I was going through the my third year, I remember very, very distinctly not having a lot of time to do anything unless I set up a schedule and was able to dedicate myself to the time that I allotted for myself. This is really where that education of how do you become efficient with managing your time and how do you do a good job um, managing that time, making sure that the quality of your output is really high. Um, scheduling yourself. We know that people who set New Year's resolutions that are really, really specific tend to stick with them a lot longer. And we know that people who tend to set ones that are more general tend to leave them alone. For example, if you promise to yourself that you're going to go to the gym every, you know, every day or you're just going to go to the gym and you're going to work out more, that's a little bit too general of a goal to hit. And by February, you'll find yourself like me who's just going to be sitting in a corner eating cake for the rest of the time. But if you take it upon yourself to actually schedule uh, specific things that you intend to cover 
over a, a very short period of time, say one chapter in a book that's a very easy chapter to read, say three to five pages, okay? That's entirely doable to do in an evening after you come home from the hospital. If you know that you have a commute ahead of you and you're not responsible for driving, because I don't want anybody texting and driving or reading textbooks and driving, but if you're on a subway or you're on a bus or you're in an Uber or something to and from the hospital, use that time to your advantage. You know, put Facebook away, put the social media stuff away, take out the ebook version of whatever you're using to study or UWorld app and do some questions and read some chapters in your commute. You can use that time to be really, really efficient for yourself and you'll actually find that the quality of it gets really good. One of our questions that we had before this was, you know, do we recommend doing UWorld questions or flashcards during the day on your phone while you're on your clerkships? And my answer to that is 100% definitely, but realize that there's a time and a place for something like that. You obviously don't want to do them when you're rounding, the attendings in front of you, your residents are there, you're trying to present a patient, you weren't paying attention to what your, you know, co-medical student was saying. You get pimped on a question about renal disease and then you don't really know what anybody's talking about. That doesn't look very good. But there is a lot of downtime during the day. There is a lot of time, especially when you might be admitting patients and your team just hasn't been called to admit for a while. You can use that opportunity to take out the textbook, take out eWorld, and cover a few questions or at least a small chapter about something that you might be prepared to go see. That sort of segues into another topic about how do I make sure that my how do I make sure that I'm I'm covering all the material that I need to in a good way? Well, first rule is that it's actually sort of obvious. If you've got a patient coming in, you know you want to read up everything upon that patient's disease or symptom that they might be presenting with. Somebody comes in with dizziness. I remember back when I was a medical student, this was my my preceptor's favorite chief complaint for anybody coming into the ED, dizziness. You'd want to think, what questions do I need to ask this person with dizziness? Because you know that with the right questions will come the right differential. And these are going to echo the same kind of clinical vignettes that you're going to see on the CK when the time comes. So understanding a good history, understanding how classically certain symptoms present or how certain diseases present. And you'll get more experience at this when you're actually seeing patients in the emergency room or on the floor. Uh, when you are preparing yourself to go and interview a patient, it doesn't hurt to maybe take that textbook out of your bag, open to the chapter that has to do with maybe their chief complaint that the senior resident told you about, and brush up a little on the background behind it. Know what you want to ask, know what you want to examine, and then know what sort of differentials you want to do. Following that, you can work and study at the same time if you have your resources out in front of you while you're typing up your student notes. This is an excellent opportunity to put your thoughts down on paper, thinking about what a clinical exam would look like, what the history should look like, what things may not sound so great in their history that don't quite add up. Uh, and as I look over here, I'm seeing that things are flying across the screen, which is super cool. Um, I see some anger faces and some flowers and stuff. So again, you know, this is an open forum. If people are disagreeing with what I'm saying or you have uh, differences of opinions, please write in the comments. We're happy. To, I'm happy to address them. You know, this is a this is a forum here. We're we're happy to get some other ideas. Um, but what I was saying is essentially, if you're going through writing a note and uh, thinking about what the patient has, you know, that's an opportunity for you to have up to date up or your textbook up or something like that to help you sort of compare and contrast what is textbook and what isn't, and figure out a good differential diagnosis. Um, before that patient goes out to the wards and at least when you when it comes time to present that patient to the attending and the rest of the team it'll show that you did your homework and that you actually thought about what this patient may have um, when it comes to doing u world on the on the wards that can get a little bit tricky because we know that the u world questions tend to be a little bit more random in terms of subject material and at the same time uh, it doesn't always look good if your head is buried in your phone or your laptop when you probably should be doing something to contribute to the team, and I understand that. Um, like I said, there is some times during the day when you can go and find some downtime, run to the library for 20 minutes, do a couple of world questions, come back to the team, uh, especially on slower days, maybe pre-call days when you're not admitting anybody. And similarly, in your commuting time, if you are able to use your commuting time to something beneficial, that's an excellent time to start doing you all. I know that uh, when I was doing my clinical rotations in New York, I relied on a subway to get everywhere. So for me, that hour of subway ride was a U world block because lucky for me, 40 questions in U world is a timed for one hour to complete. And while I didn't get to go into the in-depth nature of all of the explanations, at least I previewed the questions and had a chance to 
critically think about what I wanted to do. I knew that if there was something that I got wrong, I could go home at the end of the day and pull them up on my computer and really review the ones that I wanted to ask myself uh, again, rather than spending the entirety of my four or five hours at home after the hospital uh, focusing on one you will block. I could think about it during the day, maybe research it over the course of the day, and then if I didn't get to anything that was missing, I could go back at home and do it, and it wouldn't take that much more time. I remember definitely what it feels like to come home after a really busy rotation, well, probably because I still do that because I'm a resident, but when you're a medical student, you know, you come home, you've been probably thrown around a little bit, you've admitted patients, you don't quite know what's going on a lot of the time, and now you're coming home and you're expected to study for five hours straight. That just doesn't sound reasonable, and it doesn't sound possible. And I'll be honest, it really isn't possible. I can't really think of any time that I would come home after a rotation at five, six, seven o'clock at night, never seeing the sunlight for a given period of day, and then expected myself to sit down for five more hours and study until one o'clock in the morning. It's not gonna happen, we both know this. How do you get around that and ensure that what you're doing is quality work? Well, one, your weekends are your friends. Um, just like in your preclinical years, you studied really, really hard on the weekend. You really tried to take what you learned during the week, metabolize it again, reread things, try to commit it to memory, and then try to link it to other subjects. The same rules apply for your third year of medical school. No matter what rotation you're on, you're always going to be able to do this with the right resources. And we can go over some of our official recommendations for resources as well toward the end of the webinar, or toward the end of the live session, I should say. Um, but when, you, when you're going home, you, know, you really want to use your weekends to your advantage. That's where I got the majority of my studying done, and those are my marathon days. And the nice thing about it is that going to you know, do my rotations in a city like New York, I knew that there was always something going on and something fun that I always wanted to do. So I would devote a good majority of my day to preparation and studying for my shelf exams, for my CK. And then I knew that after a certain time, when I knew I put the work in, then it was total play, I put the books away, I didn't even think about it anymore. And I still had an amazing quality of life as a third year medical student. You guys are able to have that too, okay? It goes back to saying that time efficiency is certainly the most important thing. You want to think about, oh, I see here, Layla is cheering me on. Layla, thank you for the shout out on the last Facebook Live session. That was super, super kind. I see all the hearts going by. I'm just going to assume they're coming from you, so thank you so much. And I'm gonna pin this comment because, Layla, I love you. Um, anyway, going back, to, <laughs> going back to what we were talking about. Um, what were we talking about? We were talking about resources and then allocating your time appropriately and how time efficiency is the most important. You know, you've got all the resources in front of you. You want to think about how you're going to chop them up and you want to make sure that you're setting serious deadline goals to read everything and do questions on everything that you could possibly need to do in a given moment, uh, or at least for a given subspecialty. Um, See if you can correlate your patients to certain blocks in your world. It's totally acceptable to do your year world questions in subject-based mode during your actual rotations. If you're seeing a patient with ulcerative colitis, do GI questions. You know, any sort of GI question or learning opportunity is going to come back and help you understand other presentations of inflammatory bowel disease. And at the same time, it's going to help you understand different ways that different types of gastrointestinal problems can present themselves. Realize that everything is a learning opportunity and that while you may not see every single disease that's tested on the step or the shelf in the wards, they are somewhere in a textbook. So what are the good resources to think about using for your CK? Well, and for that matter, when do I even start studying for CK? Because I've got a whole year to prepare for this. Is this like step one? Well, remember how step one was a test that tested your preclinical knowledge, so your first two years of medical school? Step two CK will play on some of those basic science concepts. Heavy hitters from your basic science years are gonna be your pathophysiology, your physiology, and definitely your pharmacology, because they want you to know how things work and how people get sick and what changes in physiology to make people ill. Uh, to add on to that, we need to think about how we want to diagnose these patients, what kind of tests are the best ones to order for a certain set of symptoms or a disease, understanding some evidence-based medicine principles such as specific tests versus sensitive tests for identifying symptoms and causes of them, 
and knowing when it's appropriate to act and intervene by doing something that might be potentially risky, like an intubation or a surgery, versus treating something more medically and delaying the intervention before you actually have an answer. Uh, this is part of the art of medicine. We think about this all the time on the wards, and this is hopefully some of the skills that you're getting a taste of as you go further into your medical education, but step two CK really is gonna be your first exam into thinking how can I use the art of medicine? How can I think about the nuances of diagnosis to get to my answer? And these things are really going to be found in the resources that you study. So it is absolutely imperative that, I mean, obviously you have to be a very participating member of your medical team or your OBGYN team or surgery team to learn something practical. But when you go home and on the weekends, you really want to owe it to yourself to learn that theory, you know, put that theory into your head um, so that you not only can pass the exams, but you understand why we do the things that we do inside of a hospital. What resources do you recommend I use? Well, there are lots of different ones. And you also have to remember that the, the when preparing for CK, Day one of studying for the exam really does happen on the day one of your third year of medical school. That's very, very important to say because that might be the first time, if you're starting on OBGYN, those first six weeks of your, of your uh, third year, that's gonna really be the only time that you see OBGYN patients in the hospital on a full-time basis. And that might be the only time you ever pick up that OBGYN textbook and go through it uh, with any sort of serious nature because you know you're trying to prepare for the shelf. So realize that every single rotation is sort of like a beginning of a new, I guess, year or semester for you. Really take the time to be serious in how you want to go about doing that. I recommend having a textbook for every course or every uh, clerkship that you do. Uh, one for medicine, one for surgery, one for OBGYN. Ideally, the ones that you want to pick are going to be the ones that are written by the people who also write questions for the exams. The reason why this is important is because these are the people who know the material you need to know, and it keeps coming up over and over again on the test, so you don't really need to worry about it. And they keep coming up over and over again on practice questions, so you also don't need to worry about it. Uh, what are these books? Well, the ACP, the American College of Physicians, puts out an excellent one. It is now, I think, uniquely an ebook now, but it comes with an accompanying question bank. It's called I Am Essentials. You can check it out on the ACP website. And I very much recommend using that book. These are the people who write the shelf exam. They also contribute largely to the step two CK exam in terms of question writing. And these are the same people who actually help to make the board exams for internal medicine. And they contribute to the MKSAP, the board review series for internal medicine. So you know that these people are very, very well versed in IM education. And they're also very well versed in writing test questions that you can expect to see. Please, do those questions. Please go over their questions. Please read their book because then you'll have a really great understanding of the theory that they could potentially ask you on the exam. Uh, for surgery, there's lots of excellent thing at, things out there. The standard flagship textbook is the Lawrence Book of General Surgery. That one can get kind of bulky sometimes. And admittedly, it might not be the most friendly thing to read simply just because it's got a lot of theory into it. So how do you make a decision of buying a book that has maybe a little bit less theory but tells me what I need to know? I found, uh, and I think a lot of our uh, tutors will agree as well, that the NMS casebook is a nice sort of hybrid in that area. Uh, it is a very well-written book that's sort of written from a case perspective, so it poses you with questions as to how you would want to proceed with the management of a surgical patient in all different types. It covers everything from trauma to a little bit of pediatrics to thyroid and endocrine surgery to general abdominal surgery characteristics and then burns and sort of those extra electrolyte physiology questions as well that are very, very commonly appearing on the surgery shelf and on the step two CK. When you go further into something like OBGYN, I found uh, the Beckman book to be very, very uh, helpful. That's sort of the classic one for it. And it's written and endorsed by the ACOG, which is the governing body for OBGYN, especially the people who write the shelf questions. With that comes a bunch of practice questions in their own Q bank on their website. And they correspond with the chapters in that textbook. So all of that information can be found uh, on the ACOG's uh, information page. So I would definitely check something like that out. Uh, and you can study and read and do questions on the same material as you go through the chapter. In fact, in that book, there are certain areas that are highlighted already for you because they sort of emphasize the main points of what they expect you to know. So it makes it really, really easy. Pediatrics, the flagship book tends to be Nelson's. 
uh, for students. There is a big Nelson's for pediatric uh, attendings and residents, which is ginormous, and I wouldn't recommend that that's too much. Um, but there is a smaller book that isn't that much smaller. It's still 700 pages because pediatrics is a huge subject. But within it, there are some great uh, go-to chapters that really help to outline some of the more common things you'll experience on the shelf. Heart, congenital heart disease, fluid electrolytes for pediatrics differs very greatly than it does from adults, so it might be good to read something like that up. And at the same time, any other gastrointestinal issues, as a radiologist, it's always good because they like to test um, a lot of your pediatric abdominal x-ray findings, your double bubble signs, your triple bubble signs, things like that. So those are tend to be more high-yield questions. So that book will definitely cover everything. The nice thing about it is that the chapters are super short, one to two pages at most, um, albeit there are hundreds of chapters in there, but it does feel like you're covering a lot of ground as you go through them, and in a given topic, you'll understand them all very well, having read a relatively small amount. Uh, following that, psychiatry comes into play a lot. There are lots of books out there that cover psychiatry, and the subject material for, for psychiatry really is no different than what you studied for your step one exam, which is excellent news. Um, how step two likes to play upon psych questions is that they'll start to ask you it from a different perspective. They'll start to ask you what kind of medicine you might want to treat a patient with with a given set of psychiatric symptoms. It requires you to think in two steps. How do I get the diagnosis first based upon what they're telling me in the vignette, and two, what is the drug of choice for treating this kind of psychiatric condition? Uh, the first aid book for psychiatry is actually quite good. It does cover this material in excellent detail, tells you exactly what you need to know uh, from a very evidence-based approach. And um, it is reminiscent and up-to-date with the current DSM-5 teachings um, since that has come out a couple of years ago. So you know you're getting the right resource. Uh, additionally, uh, and finally, some of you may be required to take a family medicine rotation. On the uh, American uh, Family Medicine Governing Bodies website, I'm drawing a blank exactly upon what the governing body is called. If Layla can help me out there in cyberspace, that would be helpful. But on their website, it's free for medical students to sign up, and there are question banks uh, on there that are tested for the shelf exam because they do repeat themselves. So students have free access to this, doesn't cost a dime, and you can go in and access hundreds and hundreds of practice questions for family medicine if you're required to take a shelf by your school. Uh, some of you may have to go and take a neurology rotation. Um, the verdict is still out on a lot of what are the better resources to use for neurology. The I Am Essentials book does have a chapter on neuro specifically, so a lot of that has some good crossover. But Reminding yourself of your neuroanatomy, reminding yourself of a good neuro, neuro exam, and then doing your u old questions for neuro can definitely help you get that score that you need to on your, on your shelf exam. And I think that covers most of the, most of the clerkships that you would be required to take in your third year, uh, give or take a few. Some, some schools require less, some schools may require more. Um, we're hoping to get a radiology one at some point going, but in time, in time. Um, unless there are any other questions, I'm not sure if I could comment on anything else. I feel like we've talked a lot about strategies that you can use during your third year to really accelerate your, your preparation for step two CK. Realize that the shelf exams are sort of check marks to make sure that you understand a set of information as you go along, and that every time you cover a new rotation's worth of material, this is a new opportunity to study for the exam, and really start to build that quality foundation that you'll need to go back and prepare for it. The step two CK is, um, in my opinion, a little bit more fun of an exam to take because it actually starts to ask you questions as if you were a doctor. And when you take the exam, uh, it does test your clinical reasoning. Uh, studying for this early, studying this from the day your third year of medical school begins is going to be imperative to your success on the test. And knowing that you've got that quality foundation of doing questions over time and reading over time over the course of your entire MS3 year is really gonna set you ahead of the pack for scoring high on the exam. When it comes to dedicated study period, um, I suppose dedicated, most people take about a month of dedicated study to study for CK, mainly just because they have been studying for the shelf exams really diligently all year. If you're not the best shelf exam performer, um, you might want to consider taking a little bit more time, if your school will allow it, to go back through UWorld, maybe reread IM Essentials at the very least, because IM does account for maybe 60 to 70% of the questions on the exam. And uh, you can, 
improve yourself uh, over that prolonged period. Uh, I do see some questions coming in here. Um, what do I think about the shelf NBMEs? Oh, that's an excellent question. There are a few of them out there. I love the shelf NBMEs personally when I was going uh, through my third year. I thought they were an excellent practice opportunity to see what kind of questions would be posed to you on the actual shelf exam. And you are bound to see some repeats on the actual shelf from the NBME shelf exam. So it might be in your interest to take a look at those resources. Um, know what they're asking you, have a good feeling for them, and they tend to correlate well with performance. So if you are doing well on those practice exams, the shelf practice ones do correlate pretty accurately with your actual score. The Step 2 CK uh, NBME resources also are very valid. They are helpful uh, to understand sort of everything at the end of the day to go through each subject material. In terms of how they may correlate to score, it might be a little bit harder to say simply just because there aren't as many of them, say, as you had to prepare for step one. So it might be hard to get a better um, sample size of that. But um, in general, as we know, any kind of any kind of preparation you can do with practice exams and practice questions is going to be beneficial to you. And realize that you know, even if you're not necessarily performing super well on these things, it goes back to the preparation that you put in beforehand. You know, did you treat day one of your OBGYN rotation like this is the only time I have to learn this material? This is what I need to know to ace this stuff. And if you can honestly say that, then you know, really, really you can go through it and really understand that you're, you should do well on the exam. If not, if you're not in that position, take some time to think about what you can do in the time that you have left to allocate your mindset, see what you can do to organize your resources, stay as focused as possible, do some practice questions, try to understand what are the highest yield points and maybe read up more on that, and really hold yourself accountable for that time that you have and for what you don't know to fill in those in those mental deficiencies that you might not have in terms of the facts. Um, they can be filled in luckily, and uh, you guys have made it so far already. I mean, this is not, um, you know, you, you, you all have the tools and the, the willpower to make it into the next phase of this kind of thing. So I don't have any doubts uh, in that aspect. You're all such hard workers, I know, to make it to your third year as it is. So keep up the good work and, and go from there. Um, I see here, do you think your shelf exam scores are predictive of your step two CK performance? Uh, I do. I do think that they are. If we're going to think numbers, uh, raw numbers, it's really hard to predict. People who tend to, and I can say this sort of generally, people who score well throughout their shelf exams tend to score well on CK. That is true. And people who tend to score poorly on their shelf exams, I'm going to say, actually, it is not a guarantee that you will do poorly on CK. You have the ability to turn things around at the very end there and make CK actually a really great result of the exam because the shelf exams are hard. Like we all know this. I mean, we've taken shelf exams before. You guys have probably taken a good half of them to maybe all of them. Um, they can be really difficult. Uh, that said, when you're preparing for CK, um, you can understand what you didn't quite get the first time around, turn on the jets, look at a review book, really understand those things that you weren't quite 100% in and find that you will do really well on the actual CK exam. People who have done well on the shelf exams all along, if you continue in that trajectory of how you've been studying, yes, you will do well on the CK exam because in theory, it shouldn't change. The reason why you will do well in CK is because your preparation for the shelves has been reflective of how you prepare for exams and what kind of success you can expect to see moving forward. I'm seeing a little bit of a paucity here when it comes to the questions rolling in, so I think I'll I'll start to close out here. I just wanted to thank everybody for joining me today. I had a lot of fun doing this. Um, this will be posted on our, um, oh wait, I have another question here. If I choose a specialty that I think I wanna do, but don't do well in that clerkship, should I reconsider the specialty choice? Not necessarily, that's actually a really good question. Um, it's, you know, it's really hard to maybe come to terms with the fact that it's like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing so well in this. But at the same time, why is it that you aren't doing so well, okay? Interest is one thing, for sure. If you have a really good interest and a really good passion for something, that's certainly one thing. But why is it that you're not scoring or performing where you need to be in order to uh, succeed in that kind of thing? Second of all, 
when you think about how you might do perceptively, maybe not necessarily on paper, but what kind of letters of recommendation could your attendings write for you in that specialty? That can really help when coming to apply for a given specialty. I don't want to necessarily discourage anybody from not going into something just because their exam score was poor, say, on the, on the shelf or something. But keep in mind, what was it specifically that got me thinking you know, why, why didn't my result come out to the way that it should have been? You know, if it comes down to studying and preparation for it, then that's something that can be internally worked upon and, and improved. You know, that's, that's, if that's where the deficiency lies, and that's the thing that really does need to step it up. Fortunately, performing on your step one and your CK, if you turn that around and score really well on your CK and do really well on that exam, that's going to be a really nice sigh of relief for a lot of residency programs who are going to look at that in the future. Do your clerkship scores matter to residencies when applying? They absolutely do. In fact, they're, they're probably more important than your step one score. But you do want to consider what can I do to make my CK as a, as a last resort look as well as possible uh, before I go into that application process and start interviewing with them. Um, that might be the last opportunity you have um, to objectively show a program how well fit you are for a given specialty, even if the paper stuff didn't come out as great like on a shelf exam or something like that. Letters of record are also very powerful, but um, people tend to like to see hard facts and figures when it comes to that kind of stuff. So definitely keep that in mind when applying. Um, if there are any questions that I couldn't get to today, or if you've got any other questions that come up after the fact that you really want to ask, you can always email us at hq at medschooltutors.com. Uh, also, the people in our office are super cool, and they love to talk to students and help them out with any of their anxieties or thoughts that they might have about um, the steps or wanting to have a tutor for help or just questions to ask about this kind of advising thing. And if you wanted to give us a call, we're at 212-327-0098. Uh, next time, we're, I guess episode three of our, of our Facebook Live uh, programming is going to be Emma Hussein. She's going to come on on Thursday, March 1st at 1230, and we really hope you tune into the topic that she's going to talk about. I think we're still, uh, I'm, at least I have not been uh, privy to what she is going to talk about, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to be something really, really great and high yield for you all. So um, I hope you have a wonderful time, and we will hopefully see you soon. Enjoy.